1963, Berlin, Third Reich. The small sedan was sitting just as promised, across the street from the ice cream vendor shuttering his small stand as the evening shadows lengthened and darkness fell across the public plaza. The lone tall figure quickened his pace as he absentmindedly tugged his hat down over his eyes as far as it would go. His American contact had been very clear. By 7.35 p.m., the vehicle and his single opportunity to escape the Reich would be gone. As he neared the vehicle, a man in the front seat opened the passenger side door for him. Without waiting for an invitation, the tall man hurriedly sat himself inside the vehicle. Pull your hat up. Try to look nonchalant. You look scared. The driver was surprisingly casual as he put the vehicle into drive. He was dressed in a casual suit, typical of the German style of the day for working professionals, with a neat haircut and an easy smile on his face. His window was rolled down to let the cool evening air in as he drove, his arm propped on the windowsill. He didn't know what to expect from the CIA, but he never pictured his flight from the Reich to resemble a casual evening drive. You have your papers? The driver cast a glance at the man's briefcase. Ah, yes, uh, research notes, designs, and specs for the upcoming moon. No, I mean your identification papers. We'll need them for the checkpoint. The man blushed. Ah, yes, of course. Always. My family? Last I heard, they were on their way to Morocco. They'll meet you in Florida about a week after you get there. The man nodded grimly. As casual as the American spy seemed to be taking the whole affair, his own nerves were inversely frayed. The American seemed to pick up on this. You must relax, Ed, doctor. He nodded. Twenty minutes later, they reached a small airport near the Berlin outskirts. The city was massive, but traffic flowed neatly and efficiently, just like the Reich itself. A neat, efficient, orderly, utterly cold and inhuman thing. As the sedan approached the checkpoint, he felt his stomach tightening into a knot. Remember, Herr Doctor, relax. The American smiled wide as they slowed for the waiting guard. The military policeman, a reservist by the look of it, asked for the papers. The American casually offered his own, then motioned to the doctor to present his. He nearly fumbled and dropped them in his nervousness, eliciting a raised eyebrow from the policeman. When he grabbed his papers, though, and brought them to the light to get a closer look, his eyes widened slightly, and he ducked down to look inside the vehicle at the passenger. Herr Braun! Herr Doctor! My apologies! Dr. Werner von Braun shooed away the man's apologetic look. Apologies again, Dr. Braun. I, you're my hero, my kid. All he talks about is space because of you. I'm so sorry, doctor, but if you have a moment, may I have an autograph for my boy? Braun nodded, smiling as the happy guard handed him a notepad out of his pocket, typically used to record information for incident reports. He signed the pad obligingly, dedicating the autograph to the guard's son. In the back of his mind, he struggled to suppress a growing sense of betrayal. Thank you so much, doctor. Please go ahead. Again, thank you so much. The American politely excused them in a perfectly accented German and pulled away. Fifteen minutes later, Braun was on a small private plane flying to destinations unknown. He'd only been told what he needed to about his escape plan no more than that. Washington, D.C., 36 hours later, Dr. Braun sat listlessly in the nondescript office deep in the belly of the CIA. He was growing restless. His journey out of Europe had been circuitous, a private flight to a still neutral Switzerland, well, neutral in name only, and from there a public flight to Egypt under a false identity with some hefty makeup and latex work to conceal his all-too-famous identity. His expectation of the clandestine world of spies and counter-spies had been based on the popular movies of the time, pitting the Sisterheitsdienst up against the clever CIA and their devious plots to undermine the spiritual and physical purity of the Reich. Naturally, these films heavily featured outlandish schemes, such as tainting German genetics with, quote, mongrel blood. These movies became very popular in the Reich, but the real world of espionage had turned out to be terribly mundane. A fake disguise he swore every airport security agent he passed could see right through, followed by a seat on a Deutsche Lufthansa flight to Cairo, then a regional airline connecting him to American-occupied Morocco, and then finally a Delta flight to Washington. He'd expected an escort by expertly trained and lethal CIA agents ready to take down any threat with their bare fists if necessary. Instead, he'd flown alone in economy the entire way. It made sense in a way, just another unimportant face lost in the crowd. He'd been sitting in his office for the better part of an hour at what he assumed would be his official debriefing. He turned over his briefcase full of schematics and plans for the current and new generation of German long-range rockets, even the Schwerer Adler the rocket that would put Nazi astronauts on the moon. The Reich had beaten the Americans to space, even beaten them to landing a probe on the moon, Venus, and Mars. They were set to cement their win in space by landing men on the moon within eight years. Braun had been instrumental in the effort, 
Though he'd always been uncomfortable using his knowledge to build weaponized rockets fitted with nuclear weapons that could strike almost anywhere in the United States, it was a means to an end, he told himself. His real passion was space. This was mankind's future. He told himself it didn't matter who ended up making it out there. The United States or the Reich both would eventually be forgotten to history, but he'd only been able to turn a blind eye to the Reich's horrors for so long, and the recent conquest of the Russian Far East had been the final straw. The Soviets had been crushed at long last, but in this growing age of media, it didn't take long for photo and film evidence of the Reich's cultural programs to make their way out to the wider world. There was no denying the atrocities of Hitler's Third Reich any longer. The door opened suddenly, snapping Braun out of his trance. A man about his age entered the room, smiling at him as he shook his hand and introduced himself as Richard Lowe. The second younger man that had entered remained standing as Lowe sat behind his desk. He did not look nearly as pleased as his partner, or was it his boss? Braun found it hard to tell. After a few pleasantries, Braun got down to brass tacks. Mr. Lowe, I'm ready to fully cooperate with your intelligence services, or perhaps even NASA itself. I have extensive knowledge of… Ah, yes, we've gone over your literature. We're much obliged for the help, Mr. Braun. We'll be setting you up with an expense account. Not quite what you might be used to back home, but still quite comfortable, I promise you. At least until you find work. Braun was confused. I'm sorry, Mr. Lowe, I don't think I understand. With your expertise, I believe a teaching position should be relatively easy to come across. Though I'm not so sure how many universities will be happy to have a Nazi on staff, especially one so famous. Braun moved his mouth like a fish out of water, but no words came out. In all the scenarios he'd gone over during his plan to escape the Third Reich, none of them went anything like this one. He was growing more confused. Mr. Lowe, as I said, I promise you I'm fully prepared to cooperate. We heard you, Doc, and we thank you. It won't be necessary. This time it was the man who'd remained standing who answered, his arms still crossed. Doctor, this is Mike Lackiar. He'll be your liaison during your settling down period. Suddenly there was a knock at the door, and a secretary stuck her head in let Lowe's invitation. Sir, reminder as you requested, it's about to air. Ah, yes, thank you, Linda. Lowe turned to the TV in his office and turned it on. The TV clicked as it changed to the expected channel. John F. Kennedy, President of the United States of America, was in the opening lines of a nationwide announcement. Dr. Braun, I believe you'll find this very interesting. Braun did find the speech interesting. The event was being broadcast live, which impressed Braun. He was used to taped conferences in the Reich, which could be better edited for unwanted content. As he watched, Braun felt his heart sink slightly. NASA Chief James E. Webb stood behind the president and in front of a large board, showcasing various diagrams, which to Braun's trained eye were immediately obvious. It was a multi-stage mission to the moon. But what impressed him the most was the cutaway to reveal a massive gleaming rocket. They called it the Saturn something, Braun missed the full name in his shock. It was the rocket that would carry Americans to the moon. When do you launch? This time it was Aguiar who answered, with no small amount of smug satisfaction. Two years, three tops. This Saturn can make it all the way to orbit. 311,000 pounds, enough for a lander, hell, enough for the buggy they're thinking. Braun shook his head in disbelief. Brain scoop. Excuse me, doctor? Lowe turned the TV volume down slightly. Sorry, German expression. You scooped up talent from all over the world. Of course you did. We made it easy for you. What's the line, Mr. Braun? Amerikanscher Mischling? Yes, mongrels. Braun finally spotted the Hispanic heritage on Aguiar's face. There was another knock at the door. The young secretary stuck her head in again. Mr. Lowe, they're ready. Thank you again, Linda. We'll be right out. Lowe stood and made his way around the desk to help the stupefied Brown out of his chair. I don't understand. What am I here for? Lowe smiled, ushering Brown out of his office to a waiting group of photographers who began to take a flurry of photographs. You're here for photos, Mr. Brown. Remember to smile. Ural Mountains, sometime later. Elsewhere, it was still summer, but in the high overpasses of the Urals, winter was always early. Despite this, the laboring men had taken their jackets off, unloading crates of ammunition, explosives, and supplies from a mule-drawn wagon. Nikita grunted as he removed one of the last remaining wooden crates. The side of the crate had once been stamped with customs information from the Port of Los Angeles, far away in California, and receiving information from the Chinese port in Hong Kong. There had been a significant effort made to destroy this stamp, but whoever had done the job hadn't quite succeeded or cared. This crate would need to be burned. It had been stressed to all the guerrillas how important it was to shield the United States from any culpability in their attacks if they wanted the supplies to keep flowing. 
He groaned as he tried to pry the lid off, until Guchlug, one of the Mongolian Borchkas that was part of the group, arrived with a crowbar. The burly man worked at the nails holding the lid shut as Nikita tried to keep the whole crate secure for him. In the effort, Guchlug spotted a silver crucifix tumble out from underneath Nikita's shirt. With a grunt, he finally opened the lid of the crate, exposing the explosive charges wrapped in waterproof bags and nestled in hay. Nikita gave a low whistle. The Americans have been generous today. Gochlug nodded his agreement as the men began to remove the explosives. Some they would take with them, others they would leave in secret caches all across the mountains. They worked in silence until Gochlug nodded at the crucifix still hanging outside Nikita's shirt, unnoticed. Strange to see a communist with a crucifix. Nikita looked down at his collar but did not conceal the crucifix. Communism is dead, comrade. Gochlug smiled. Okay then, strange to see a man of God handling explosives. Not so strange these days, I think. Didn't your god say, turn the other cheek? Nikita nodded as he put one of the explosive charges along with a detonator into his personal pack. Inside it was a pistol he'd looted from a dead Nazi soldier, along with a first aid kit and ammo for his rifle. The Lord also said, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Gutschlug stopped, confused. Then he gestured at the explosives. How is this living peaceably with the Germans? So far as it depends on you. I didn't choose to be thrown into a camp, friend. I didn't choose to watch the Nazis kill millions of my people. I didn't choose this war. Gutschlug nodded. He was Borchka, or so the Soviets called him. Nobody really knew where the term had come from, but it had been used to describe the many volunteers from across old Russian Far East, Mongolia, and even China who joined the surviving Soviet guerrilla bands in their war against the Nazis. But Gulchlug was also Buddhist. Matter of fact, it was the reason he was here now. Defending oneself and others is good, but violence should be committed without hatred. Do you hate the Nazis for what they have done? Nikita was silent for a long while. I did. Sometimes I still do, but I pray. Gulchlug nodded his agreement. Prayer is good. Meditation, good. Your lord would make a good Buddhist. Nikita laughed. You Buddhists would make good Christians. Ural Mountains, 73 hours later. Steel and iron screamed in agony as thousands of tons of train and cargo jumped the mountain tracks and crashed into the surrounding landscape. The guerrillas had planned their attack carefully, striking inside a deep gorge that the Nazi rail line cut through. It was one of the furthest points from civilization that the train passed through delivering coal, oil, and other raw materials from the mines and wells east of the Urals to the massive industrial center the Nazis had grown outside of Moscow. It was a place so remote, Nazi patrols didn't even believe the Soviet guerrillas could reach it, the surrounding countryside being mountains reaching over 10,000 feet each, and nothing so much as a goat trail leading them through here. But the surviving Soviets had learned how to hide from the Nazis after their invasion east of the Urals to crush the remaining Soviet state four years ago, and subsequent genocide or mass imprisonment and deportation of the survivors. They'd also learned to go where Nazis couldn't, or wouldn't, they become as tough as the mountains through which no road could be cut. The train was not carrying oil, or there would have been a massive explosion by now. That meant that there was opportunity for salvage, and the group of 30-odd guerrillas swarmed out of their hiding places to rush the wreckage below. Figures began to emerge from some of the front cars that weren't fully consumed in flames yet. Survivors in Nazi uniforms. Nikita did not fire at the men pulling themselves from the wreckage, but his compatriots had no such qualms. The survivors fled the approaching flames and pulled themselves from the shattered train cars, only to be cut down by machine gun and rifle fire. A squad of armed guards must have been stationed in one of the carts that hadn't suffered much damage. As soon, the descending guerrillas were under fire themselves. Nikita heard the distinctive oomph sound of someone being shot in the chest near him and dove for cover. He took careful aim and returned fire at a Nazi popping out of the overturned car's window. The man staggered backwards from the impact of the rifle round and collapsed inside. Some of the guerrillas were close enough to use grenades and began to toss some inside the overturned car. Within moments, there was no further resistance, only the moaning of the dying and injured inside the car. Now the guerrillas would turn to stripping the wreckage for anything transportable or worth salvaging. But the overall mission was to shut down the Nazi shipping in the mountains and cause as much economic harm as possible. That was but one of several targeted raids that even now were playing out across the mountains surgical strikes against key nodes in the Nazi transportation network, masterminded by the same American Special Forces colonel who had sent the explosives and other supplies Nikita's band had received several days ago. The US and the Third Reich were technically at peace, technically, 
Nikita didn't join his comrades in stripping the train. Instead, he searched for the man he'd heard to be wounded in the attack. They all wore rock gray uniforms with flecks of brown and green, special camo once more provided by the Americans to help them blend in with the mountainsides, so it took a bit of searching. When Nikita found the man, his heart dropped. Gutschlug had mercifully died quickly. Nikita spotted two bullet holes, one right over the heart. He groaned as he sat next to his Mongolian friend, both from his emotional pain and the exertion on his 50-year-old stiffening joints. With a shaking hand, he closed the dead man's eyes, then gently patted his friend on the head. Father, I know what the word says, but… Nikita wiped his face with a dirt-caked hand, then shook his head slowly. But I also know your heart. Accept this good man. The old former communist sighed, leaning back against a large rock. He should be helping below, but he just didn't have the energy right now. And he didn't want to see any more dead bodies, even if they were Nazis. I'm tired, Lord. So very tired. Despite himself, Nikita cried. Werder, Germany, 14 miles outside Berlin. Erma smiled as she'd been taught to, eliciting a reciprocal smile from the assembled adults. This included her mother and father, as well as her grandmother, aunt, and her husband. But assembled in the large flower garden also was an entire family that she did not know. Not yet, anyway. It was only a matter of time until Irma got to know her future family-in-law. At 10 years old, Irma was following the new customs of the Third Reich. It wasn't a signed marriage, not exactly, but rather a careful selection that began as early as her 8th birthday. With extensive genealogical and genetic research in conjunction with the officials from the Office of Cultural Advancement, the entire affair was the pride of Heinrich Himmler's efforts to distill the purest Aryan Germans possible with the help of modern science. The man was so proud of the OCA, in fact, that he'd only partially resigned from his general governmental duties to take personal charge of the office. Hitler, who died when Irma was just two years old, had called the effort the great guarantor of the Third Reich's thousand-year reign. The ultimate result was the most optimal pairing of new generations of Germans in an effort that the authorities knew was increasingly unpopular with the people, but one they promised would not be permanent. Within three generations, we will have a Germany so pure that marriage will naturally be a matter of choice once more. But for now, we must bear the burden of laying the foundations of our children's glorious future." So had said Himmler in one of his latest television addresses. For Irma, though, this was simply the way the world was, and she smiled obediently as she'd been taught to her soon-to-be family-in-law. Eckerhard was her same age, and it seemed amicable enough when they'd been introduced. Her mother told her that she was lucky Eckerhardt had good features and an excellent family lineage. He would grow up to be a handsome and successful husband. Erma, darling, what do you want to be when you grow up? Her future mother-in-law leaned down and smiled warmly, offering her a candy. Erma gladly accepted it, and the adults laughed to themselves as she greedily ate the small chocolate. I want to be a doctor, like my mother. Erma's mother beamed proudly. Your marks at school are excellent, or so I'm told. I'm sure you'll be a fine doctor and Eckerhart will make a fine officer. What a splendid family we'll have!" Her future mother-in-law smiled, and the adults all nodded in agreement. Their marriage was still eight years away, and during that time the two families would spend time together on holidays and trips to deepen the bonds between them. Germany is family, so the Reich's propaganda ministry continuously said, and special government programs mandated holidays and vacation time for family bonding. The sun was warm in the late summer, the flowers blooming all around the two families. The garden, like the Reich itself, was a wonderfully manicured, beautiful, pleasant place to be. Irma was happy. The White House, United States of America. President John F. Kennedy turned the TV off, switching his attention back to his vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson. The news had just run another feature on America's upcoming moon mission, NASA proudly displaying the large Saturn rocket that would soon begin testing. The development had been kept a secret from the world, even the Nazis, who until just a few days ago had believed their rocket program was superior to the Americans. Johnson turned to Kennedy with a large grin on his face. I talked to Cooper over at the CIA. Says Brown was blindsided. Nazis never saw this coming. Kennedy leaned back, allowing himself a pleased smile. The United States was engaged in a dangerous affair. The big Saturn rocket that could put American astronauts on the moon could also put nuclear weapons into orbit dozens of them right over German heads. Would the space race remain about space, even as the Americans were poised to win? Or did he just ring the opening bell of a new nuclear arms race in orbit? I'm sure Herr Doctor was disappointed. Brown had claimed that all he ever cared about was man's future in space. 
But whether he meant it or not, his work had directly helped the Nazis hold the United States under threats of hundreds of ballistic missiles loaded with nuclear weapons. The only way the United States had leveled the playing field until now had been with superior air fleets of strategic bombers and hundreds more nukes than the Nazis had in their own arsenals. Werner von Braun's contributions to human spaceflight were over. The man had probably expected to put his name on history when he defected. Instead, he'd served as propaganda, taking pictures for the papers to show off another prize the US managed to snag away from Nazi Germany. Have you considered authorizing Project Bluebird? Johnson motioned at a recently unsealed file on the president's desk. It was marked all over with classification ratings, the largest of which read eyes only, in big red letters across the front. It had been hand-delivered by the director of the National Security Agency. The contents of the folder spelled out a systematic campaign to expose Nazi atrocities to the world by media manipulation both at home and abroad. It included details on the Nazi exploitation of occupied territories, along with rather unsavory photos smuggled out of both detention and extermination camps, with promises of video evidence of Nazi efforts to exterminate undesirable populations both at home and abroad. It was all an open secret, of course, but one that the world had not acknowledged to date, leaving most to consider it largely rumor or conspiracy. Project Bluebird threatened to expose what the Nazis termed its cultural advancement program for what it really was, and hopefully in a way that didn't directly implicate the United States government. Kennedy had been considering Johnson's question, then finally nodded over at the now powered down television set. I think we've provoked the Nazis enough for my first term. Let's save it for my re-election. Johnson frowned, clearly displeased with the answer. Mr. President, let me be clear. I think the American people are fine people. We have some of, if not the brightest minds in the world, the hardest workers anywhere. But were you aware a full 25% of the design team on the Saturn was naturalized Americans? Would have been more if not for the strict classification and stringent background checks to help keep a lid on the whole thing. And that's just the Saturn project, Mr. President. At least 40% of NASA and its civilian contractor ecosystem are all naturalized citizens or awaiting citizenship. Kennedy nodded knowingly. Lyndon, I'm not blind to the great boon immigration has been to this nation. Immigration fueled by Nazi atrocities and racism. Kennedy nodded again. I understand what you're saying, and I agree. Hell, the more atrocities those sons of bitches get, the more talent they drive straight into our arms. But we just put our dick on the table, Lyndon, and it's a hell of a lot bigger than theirs. We need time to play this thing out and manage any escalation before upping the ante once more. Retirement term. Retirement term was the colloquial term used to describe a re-elected president's second term, when he would no longer be up for re-election and had far greater freedom to pursue riskier domestic and foreign policy options. Fine, but John, I got something for you that can't wait for retirement. Kennedy's eyebrow raised. There was another lynching down in Georgia, more protests, small this time, but dogs, horses, the whole works nonetheless. I got people talking to the local authorities. Might have been a judge involved in the lynching, apparently. FBI is opening a federal investigation into the matter. Nobody's too happy over the whole damn thing. Kennedy nodded knowingly. Good, I don't give a damn who did the lynching. Judge, police, commissioner, hell, the state governor. I want a photo of them in cuffs with FBI agents behind them on the front page of every paper across this country. I've got good people on it, but there's more. This needs to stop, John. The Saudis, Iranians, hell. The whole world is looking at us and looking at the Nazis and wondering how one's better than the other. If we want to keep the Nazis out of the Middle East and contain them everywhere else without a war, we need to show the world why we're different. You think we can get a civil rights amendment past this Congress? I think we can make a case directly to the American people, so they know who to get angry at if they don't. Kennedy was quiet for a long while. The weight of the world and his nation's future pressed heavy on the youngest president to date's shoulders. Okay, but we need a face, someone to champion this whole thing, and it's got to be an African American man. Can't be a white man leading this charge. Won't be sympathetic with voters. Johnson leaned back in his chair, smiling at last. I know just the man for the job. Baptist preacher, speaking on behalf of the NAACP in August. I think he should be at that rally, John, as he delivers his speech. I think it could change history. Now go check out What If Hitler Won World War II, 1950s, or watch I Survived 100 Days of Nuclear War, not Minecraft.